Welcome everyone to Monday Match Analysis. I'm Gil Gross. This is the 2024 Indian Wells Preview and Prediction Show. With a bonus towards the end, I bring on Nico Pereira. We do a full Golden Swing recap. Talking about... Look, big topics. We're not we don't get too in the weeds on things, but uh we talk about all the clay court tennis that went down in February, summarized it neatly. And uh I also asked Nico about the ATP Players Council. Yes, the ever mysterious Players Council, which Nico serves on as a representative of ATP alumni. So that is what's to come. But of course, it will be the customary, the typical quarter by quarter preview with dark horses. Upset alerts, popcorn matches, quarterfinal predictions. No massive preamble necessary for Indian Wells. I think, first of all, the conditions are very well known. Famous, dare I say. It is the slowest hard court on the circuit. I, I feel pretty comfortable saying that. It's gritty like sandpaper. The ball bounces very high as well. It's desert air, but that doesn't make it fast. Andy Roddick also tweeted a picture today that was sent to him of the Penn tennis balls getting very big and fluffy very quickly, which is only going to make it slower. So there's not one way to win in those conditions. You can serve so big and hit so big that you go right through it no matter what. It doesn't matter if it's the slowest hard court in the world, uh, your power still kind of overrides that. That's one way. Or you can take advantage by moving really well and defending really well and winning the game of errors and uh, grind, 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 grind. Uh, there's multiple ways that uh, this thing can get done, right? Nonstop big tennis starting now. That's the, the last thing I'll say before I get into it. It's an Olympic year, my friends. First Masters 1000. It just doesn't stop. It's full speed ahead, starting at Indian Wells, where every single month of the calendar until October, there is something major. All right, that's enough. Let's go to the number one seed, Novak Djokovic. In his quarter is Hubert Hercoc, Kasper Ruud, Hugo Umber, Tommy Paul, Cameron Nori, and Tomas Martin Echeverry. My dark horse here is Alex Mickelson. My upset alert is you go on bear. And uh, I have no early popcorn in this quarter. So uh, let's start with, with Mickelson. Yeah, I'm not brimming with confidence on this dark horse pick, to be completely honest. I feel like I'm still cracking the code of his game and I need to watch him more. But this ultimately comes down to his results and how encouraging those results have been. Five-match win streak against opponents outside the top 50. Beat Demonor easily in Los Cabos. Awesome win there. Uh, his last two losses are a third set tie break against Tommy Paul and a 7-5 in the third set against Jordan Thompson, who is playing at a peak level. So that's kind of what it comes down to for me i mean he he does have a world-class backhand he's a very patient and smart player he serves pretty big he has some power he will come forward um in terms of his draw no obvious opportunity in this quarter it's a decent draw jama munar in the first round he's a measuring stick he makes you earn it and by the way the year taylor fritz won indian wells munar was like two points away from beating him third set tie break uh, so that's the first round. Tommy Paul, second round. He's had some rough performances this year, Tommy. You know, every once in a while. It hasn't been a terrible year, but uh, he has had some some bad ones. And Mickelson just pushed him only a few weeks ago. I chose uh, I chose him over Nuno Borges, uh, Lorenzo Sinego, Zheng Zhizhen. Those are the other guys I considered. And then also Ethan Quinn. Ethan Quinn qualified. He was placed in this quarter. Uh, for once, I'm doing my preview late enough that the qualifiers have been placed. So Ethan Quinn will face off against wildcard Patrick Kipson. Rematch of the final of the Cleveland Challenger. So that's kind of interesting. Quinn is 19. His forehand is ridiculous. I have heard great things 
from trusted sources about Ethan Quinn. So I uh, expect to hear his name more and more as we progress. But right now, it, it feels too early. He's uh, he's 0-5 in his career against top 100 players. It, that does feel like somewhat of a technicality since he just beat world number 104, Alice, in uh, the first round of qualifying. But you get the point. His resume is not really dark horse level, and that's why uh, Mickelson was the nod here. Uh, upset alert, Hugo Umber. That is obviously a surprising pick. Hugo Umber is having an exceptional 2024. He won two titles in February. Now, with those titles come a lot of matches. 12 matches played in February. He played in Europe. He went to the Middle East. Now he's going back to the U.S. Time zone adjustments, big titles. But the biggest thing, so, you know, there's a little bit of a fatigue thing for me. And I know that he essentially gets a week off because as a seeded player in this particular format, he's probably he's not going to play until the weekend. Uh, he might play Friday uh, at the earliest, right? So, so he pretty much gets a week off. Biggest thing is not the fatigue. It's a factor, but not the biggest thing. The biggest thing is that the surface is too slow, uh, in my opinion, for Hugo Ampere. Uh, Jeff Sackman from Tennis Abstract did a surface sensitivity power ranking on his excellent blog that I think it's called, what is it called? Um, Sackman's blog is called Heavy Topspin. Uh, very good. Uh, so he did a uh, surface sensitivity power ranking. And among the players whose results improve in quicker conditions, Umber was the second most sensitive to Greek Spore. Greek Spore was first. Umber was second. And uh, and that checks out. Uh, he really does need his serve to be effective, his flat backhand to be effective. Uh, the longer rallies go, the, the less likely he is to win them. Um, you know, as hot as he is, last time he played somewhere slow, Rotterdam, he lost first round to uh, Rusevori. So that's why I go Hugo Umber here. Uh, I do think Monfils is a tough is a uh, tough matchup for Hercotch. That's a potential second round. Monfils is very good at getting big serves back in play, uh, but but Hubie just too good at Indian Wells, too good at hardcourt Masters. Wasn't going to put him on upset alert. As I mentioned, no popcorn match. This format is so bad for early popcorn. And for those who don't know, uh, this needs to be it must be a first or second round match. Uh, there are no exceptions. And, uh, you know, these 64-player Master 1000s, they, you know, where 32 seeds get a bye in the first round. So that takes away a lot of possibilities. And uh, ultimately, my pick for early popcorn comes down to not only what I want to watch, but what I want to talk about. And, uh, yeah, nothing nothing jumped out here. I considered Senego Ketsmanovic, Purcell Monfils, Mickelson versus Munar. And, uh, yeah. None of those are going to be slotted in the early popcorn. All right, quarterfinal prediction is as follows. Novak Djokovic defeats Hubert Hurkacz. All right, let me start by saying there are a lot of players in this quarter who have had a lot of Indian Wells success. Djokovic, five-time champion. He's had success everywhere. You throw him aside. Uh, other than that, Paul, seven and three, lifetime record. Hercotch, two-time quarterfinalist. Davidovich Fikina, quarterfinalist last year. Nori, former champion. And three times quarterfinals or better. So in the in the bottom half here, where I'm going to start, rude to me, who's been playing a lot better. He was in consideration. Hercotch, obviously, in consideration. And Nori was in consideration. Hercotch, 10-4 at Indian Wells. Rude four and three. I do think that Casper's forehand is back to being a terrifying weapon, but when I look at the Hercotch versus Rude matchup, I do hesitate a little bit for Casper because his return hasn't been that great and the serve hasn't been great either. So I feel like Hubie could edge him mostly on that. Uh, Hercotch has been solid overall this season. I always like him at hardcourt Masters 1000s. And the court speed does not scare me. Uh, he is he is at the uh, John Isner level of serving uh, almost. I'm not saying his serve is quite as good. But what I am saying is that it does not matter where he's playing. 
uh, for, in terms of the serve. It might matter for other reasons, and that is why I think he has actually traditionally played really, really well at Indian Wells. Uh, the ball bounces high. I think that helps him. He's a, a big, tall guy who hits flat. So he, he wants the ball upstairs, high in the strike zone, in order to be aggressive. In fact, he's pretty awful at trying to be aggressive off the ground when the ball isn't up high. So he likes the high bounce, and uh, he likes the extra time on his forehand also. It does make the forehand a little bit better uh, when he's got a little bit of time. Um, the serve is great everywhere. It does not matter what, what surface, uh, what the conditions are. Uh, on the top half, Djokovic, he's got some nice matchup stuff against all of his seeds. Uh, Echeverry isn't really creative enough to attack effectively. Uh, Paul will be super tough to hit through in these conditions, but Djokovic has the patient aggression necessary uh, to force errors. And uh, against Umber, if that matchup plays out, I feel like he just needs to drag out rallies, which is very doable on this surface. So I think Djokovic is going to be pretty sharp here. Uh, psychologically, I actually always like him coming off of a loss when he has a setback. I, I think it, it motivates him. Usually that's the effect that it has. And uh, he came to Southern California very, very early, which is good. So uh, that, that shows that he uh, did not necessarily prioritize extra time resting home family. He clearly got plenty of that and, and was ready to kind of get to Indian Wells, uh, or if not Indian Wells, at least Southern California early, uh, which, which is always a help. And uh, this is a nice enough draw. Uh, Djokovic has not played here since 2019. I think he uh, navigates through to the semifinal. Reigning finalist, number four seed, Daniil Medvedev. His quarter consists of Holger Runa, Taylor Fritz, Grigor Dimitrov, Adrian Manorino, Lorenzo Musetti, and Sebastian Korda. My dark horse is Tomas Mahach. Upset alert, Sebastian Korda. Early popcorn, Nadal versus Raonic. First round match. Let us start with the young man from Czech Republic, Tomas Mahach. He has won two matches at each of his last three events. And those losses at the three events are to Hechanov, Herkoc, and Bublik. I don't just look at wins. I also look at who you're losing to. And in that case... It's what you want to see. Very, very respectable defeats. I think he's underranked outside the top 50. I like his movement. I like his backhand. Good RPM on the forehands. I still think some of the best tennis I have seen all year out of anybody was Hercotch and his win over Francis Tiafo. And maybe I'm a little too in love with that. Maybe it was some redlining uh, for a couple of hours that Mahach can't re repeat on a match-by-match -match basis. But... Um, I'm still thinking about it right now, and I'm still wondering if he can capture that, at least a, a percentage of it. And uh, if he can, I'm pretty confident he's going to win matches. Now, first round opponent here is Stan Wawrinka. Stan has a terrific record in Indian Wells. He loves these conditions. Nice and heavy for him. And last few years in his career, we've seen when Stan is at his most dangerous, it's first round matches. So I definitely need to note that, that it's a, it's a very difficult opener for Mahach. The winner of Mahach Vavrinka gets Adrian Manorino, which is ideal. This is a gritty, gritty court that Manorino will not enjoy. And uh, I believe the Frenchman will be looking forward to Miami. Upset alert, Sebastian Corda. Numbers aren't pretty. He's lost eight of his last nine matches against players inside the top 50. He is guaranteed to play an opponent inside the top 50 in his first match. It's going to be either Dan Evans or Roman Safulin. He's coming off of retirement in Dubai. Frankly, didn't look like it was anything serious, but obviously not ideal to be coming off of a retirement. And uh, this surface, it demands consistency and physicality. Gorda does not have a big enough weapon in his serve or the the kind of smooth transition game that allows him to just come forward at will where he's not going to have to play a lot of balls from the back of the court. He will. And on this surface, especially, he will. 
And right now, the consistency and the physicality, uh, it is not serving him well. And that's that's where I, I worry about Corda here. Popcorn match, Nadal versus Raonic. This was a pretty obvious pick. Uh, I kind of wish that, I don't know, Maha uh, I, I just feel like, I'll, I'll say what the other option was. Uh, if this wasn't popcorn, there was one other really good candidate. And if it was in the top quarter, it would have been in it. Uh, it is this little bottom section here where it's, it's the bottom section of this quarter where you have Musetti, the seed awaiting in the second round. And he, he faces the winner of Vonda Zonschulp and Denis Shapovalov playing on his protected ranking. It's just three guys who would feel really, really great about making a third round of a Masters 1000 right now. It's much needed for all three of them. And one of them is going to do it. So it's just a fascinating little section here. Shapovalov, Musetti, Vonda Zonschulp. And when you're looking at the draw, uh, you have a protected ranking in Shapovalov. And then in this same little section here, you have protected ranking Raonic, protected ranking Nadal. They're all bunched up here. So let's talk about Raonic Nadal real quick. For me, Rafa is the favorite in this match. Raonic is not going to be able to make the match physical. And that's what Thompson really did to beat Nadal. It's probably the best way right now to beat Nadal is to is to just wear him down. And that's what he hasn't really shown that he has the ability to do is... Uh, is, is play a physical match over a long period of time and maintain uh, good movement and good intensity. Um, and, and that's just not the way Raonic is going to play it. I don't think that bodes well. Milos has also looked to run around his backhand a lot since coming back. Like, desperately. Whenever he can find a forehand, he's doing it. And with his lack of foot speed, that's not easy to do. You know? Uh, when you leave court open and when you get yourself out of position, it's one thing if you're Tsitsipas and you do it and you're really good at recovering. It's another thing if you're Raonic and it's going to be even harder to do against Nadal's patterns and his leftiness, especially if he's redirecting the forehand down the line well. So uh, I like Nadal in that match. Winner gets Holgaruna. So this is a very, very fun section. All right. Let us go now to the quarterfinal prediction. It is. Taylor Fritz defeats Grigor Dimitrov. A little bit bold in this quarter, huh? Let's start with the top half. And uh, this is the third big event in a row with a fourth round Medvedev versus Dimitrov. Not including the ATP finals, of course, which Dimitrov wasn't in. You had Paris Bercy, you had the Australian Open, and now you have this. And you might ask, why do you remember that, Gil? Great memory, Gil. The reason is I have kind of agonized over this matchup on the previous two occasions, and now I'm doing it again for a third time. That's why I remember it. And I'm 0 for 2, because in Paris, I was like, ah, I kind of think Dimitrov might beat him. And eh, nah, Medvedev, Grigor won. In Australia, I decided... I think Grigor is ready for this. I think he does it. And then before he got to play Medvedev in his third round match, he lost to Nuno Borges. I, I still think he would have had a really good chance to beat Daniil if he avoided the upset there. Uh, so people are going to be like, I, I already know it. It's like this guy hates Medvedev. He didn't pick him to do well at the Australian Open. He's not picking him to do well again. I don't hate Medvedev. I hate his matchup against Dimitrov when Grigor is playing at his very best, which he has been in the last six months. Dimitrov does all the things that gives Daniil issues. He's speedy. He comes forward. He slices. He finds great angles with his forehand. Now, Dimitrov struggled for a lot of his career at Indian Wells, but the past three years, that has changed. Uh, he made the semis three years ago. He made the quarters two years ago. Last year, he had to retire. Medvedev made the final last year even though he complained about the surface nonstop. He was red hot at the time, and considering Zverev's level at the, at that portion of the season, I think it's fair to say that Daniil's draw opened up a bit, 
And I am not going to turn around and be like, oh no, the surface is fine for Medvedev because he made the final last year. I still think this is the worst hard court in the world for Daniil being one of the top three or four hard court players in the world. He can sometimes do things like he did last year and still make the final. But I don't think it would be the norm at Indian Wells. I think we'll look back on his career and it will be his one of his worst, if not his worst, hardcourt masters tournaments. So that's the top half and why I went with Dimitrov. On the bottom, this is somewhat well documented. I talked about this last year, but this is Taylor Fritz's best tournament. His ball striking is deadly when the ball bounces high and slow like clay. His movement is at its best on a hard court. And the stats speak for themselves. 80, 18 and 6 overall. Champion two years ago. Last year he got edged out in a slugfest quarterfinal against Yannick Sinner. That one was 6-4 in the third. His career record as the lower ranked player at Indian Wells. This is when he's not supposed to win. His career record is 10 and 5. And I think he'll make that 11-5 and five against Runa. Holger is playing okay. This is more about Taylor. Now, Fritz versus Dimitrov. I'm a little torn on this matchup. Fritz has won 9 of his last 10 against one-handed backhands. His only loss in those 10 was against Dimitrov in a third set tiebreak on Geneva Clay. It's hard to find runaround forehands against Fritz because his backhand cross court is so precise. Grigor, uh, on the other hand, tactics that work for him. He can keep the ball down low with his slice. Uh, and he's had a slightly better season than Fritz, adjusted for quality of opponent. At the end of the day, again, tough one for me here. I don't hesitate to take Fritz at Indian Wells. I, I just think he's a different beast, a different animal here. So that is why I went with Taylor Fritz to make the semifinal out of that quarter. Let's go to Yannick Sinner's quarter, the number three seed. He's got Andre Rublev, Stefanos Tsitsipas, Ben Shelton, Francis Tiafo, um, <clears throat> Francisco Serundolo, Jan Lennard Struff, and Yuri Lehechka. Dark horse here, I had to pick two. Jakob Mensik and Emil Rusevori. Upset alert is Francis Tiafo, And early popcorn is Sinner's streak and Rublev's next uh, press conference. For obvious reasons. Let's start with the dark horses. Uh, Jakob Mensik. Many of you know how I feel about him. At least if you uh, were keeping up with the channel in February, you know how I feel about him. I think he's a stud. I think he'll be seeded by the U.S. Open. Uh, he's got a qualifier in the first round. Oh, you know what? They've placed qualifiers. So that's what I had in my notes. But I can actually see who he has to play. Uh Hong um, Xiong Chan from uh, Korea. So, um, okay. Draw pretty good for Jakob Mensik in the first round. Second round, uh, Ben Shelton. The return on Mensik, it actually needs a little bit of work, but as long as uh, he can make enough, he can outsolid Ben from the back. He's much better than Ben at this point in his career already when he is on the move. Emil Rusevori, my other dark horse. Hasn't taken a bad loss all year. He has committed to consistency in a way he has never before. His shots are not as flat as they used to be. At the same time, he hasn't lost his identity as a very clean ball striking offensive baseliner. And he is a good draw. Uh, Dusan Lajevic in the first round, Francis Tiafo in the second round, which is a segue to my upset alert because it is Tiafo. This season has been a struggle for Francis. Four of his last five losses have come to players outside the top 50. His other loss was a 6-2, 6-2 against Tommy Paul. So I'm looking at two things. Who are you losing to? And when you do lose, what, what are these score lines like? That also matters to me. And uh, Francis has taken some lopsided ones. Sometimes Tiafo in the U.S., he ups his game. He just... He, he brings the energy and uh, the focus at kind of a, a higher level than sometimes he's able to on a regular basis. Last year, he played his best tennis at Indian Wells. That was his best run. U.S. Open won the title in Houston. Those were some of his highlights. But I worry about a player 
who is in rough form and then goes to defend a bunch of points. I think that's always a difficult spot psychologically for a player to be in. That's where Foe is. And uh, his semifinal last year here, it really surprised me. Just based on the surface, it hurts his backhand. It doesn't reward him as much for taking the ball as early as he does, you know, taking on returns and coming forward and, and all of that stuff. So I, I actually don't love these conditions for Tiafo, and uh, that, his form, is upset alert. Popcorn. Center 12-0 and 0 this year. Australian Open title, Rotterdam title. I just think the more he wins, the more his aura builds, the more this storyline grows. And uh, I just think it's a fun a fun thing to, to keep track of. So every time Sinner takes the court and somebody tries to beat him for the first time, I think there's some uh, intrigue and some interest with that. Rublev, press conference. Yeah, I'm just, you know, look, I'm trying to be funny here. Uh huh. But uh, his statement was not well received after his uh, Dubai appeal was successful and the ATP gave him his ranking uh, points and his prize money. And the reason why that statement wasn't well received was because it lacked remorse and it pretended that the video review would have helped the situation, uh, which is dubious, doubtful. And uh, I'm just certainly curious to see what happens in a room. Uh, full of reporters who are going to ask him questions. I'm just curious to see what he says because it's one thing preparing a statement. It's another thing uh, in, in that press conference setting. So I'm curious about that. Uh, shout out Murray versus Goffin. Goffin has never beaten Andy Murray. This might be his best chance. Goffin came through qualifying. Quarterfinal prediction. Let's do it. It is Yannick Sinner. Defeats Andre Rublev. If Rublev loses, we'll start with the top half here. If Rublev loses, everyone will automatically attribute it to the Dubai trauma, right? People will say, oh, he's psychologically not right. That could happen. You know, there might be merit to that. But Andre has the shortest memory I've ever seen on a tennis court. And I just don't make an assumption that it's going to affect him what happened last week, that it's going to affect him in the heat of battle. I don't make that assumption. Tsitsipas looms large. Tsitsipas Rublev is, an, is a potential fourth round. So that's Stefanos feeling the effect of his seeding right away. He's an 11 seed. So, I mean, when's the last time he's had to play a guy like Andre Rublev in the fourth round? Usually that comes quarterfinals. Um, now their head-to-head -head is 6-6. Rublev does a really good job going into Steph's backhand with a combination of precision and speed that's basically unparalleled. And also, Andre has been taking his backhand down the line a lot better this year, which is important against Tsitsipas to keep him honest, deter the runaround, make him move to his right, open up the backhand side of the court. In addition, Rublev has a way better track record in these conditions. Tsitsipas' record is 5-5. Five and five. Rublev's is 8-4 and four with no bad losses. And Andre has played better tennis than Tsitsipas this season in general, especially when you look at, at what Rublev was able to do in the fourth-round match against Demon Orr in Australia. Uh, that win has aged beautifully. Tsitsipas doesn't have a win that good. Uh, so, you know, look, there are some advantages that Tsitsipas has in the Rublev head-to-head, -head, but there are also some advantages for Andre, and I feel like with these circumstances, Rublev is the direction I want to go there. On the bottom, fantastic draw for Sinner. Struff hasn't been able to get it going since his injury last year. Sarindolo hasn't looked very good mentally or tennis-wise. If Shelton slips up, things could really open up here. Ben beat Yannick last time in Beijing, but it was by far the best I've ever seen Shelton serve. And the conditions there were a lot quicker. I would be surprised to see a repeat of that. Big picture with Sinner. I'm very impressed with how unimpressed he is. I'm going to say that again. That might have been hard to comprehend. I am very impressed that he is unimpressed with his first major title. And, you know, while I want him to be happy, while I hope he had a great time, while I hope he... he feels very good about himself. He deserves to. I also believe it's the mark of a champion 
that he seems so unsatisfied by it. And uh, it's why I think he has the ability to avoid a letdown here at India Wells, similar to how he avoided a letdown in Rotterdam last month. Last bad loss center took, I want to throw this out there as well. June last year in Hertogenbosch against Rusevori. I don't count a first round loss after winning a title as a bad loss. So if you take away the Cincinnati loss against Leibich, last time he lost to someone where you're like, oh, that's not somebody who he should lose to. Uh, Rusevori on the grass last year. Remarkable. Okay. We now move on to Carlos Alcaraz's quarter, the number two seed. He's got Alexander Zverev, Alex Dimonor, Karen Hachanov, Alexander Bublik, Nicholas Jari, and Talon Griekspor. Dark horse here, Jack Draper. Upset alert, Sasha Bublik. Early popcorn, Alcaraz versus Arnaldi slash Vanash. Round two. Okay, we begin with the dark horse, Jack Draper. You guys are definitely bored of this. This is not exciting. I have uh, put him in dark horse a couple times recently. Uh, and I just want to say that you don't need to deal with it for very much longer because I uh, I predicted him to finish the year 11 in the world. So that gives you an idea of how high I was on Draper coming into the year. Now he started 62 and now he's up to 37. So he's approaching Seated territory where you will no longer have to listen to me put him as dark horse. Uh, yes, he retired in the Acapulco semifinal. Uh, illness. So, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming th that's usually good, right? You like to see illness. What I don't want to see is uh, the hip hurts, the shoulder hurts, the, the elbow hurts. That's what I don't want to see. But when it's illness, uh, it, it's more, it's less worrisome. Upset alert is Alexander Bublik. Tough draw here. Uh, he gets the winner of Jerry Shung, who qualified and who is on the rise, or Jordan Thompson, who has been balling. Both guys will outduel Bublik from the baseline, even if he's engaged and buttoned up. And uh, it's not the best surface for his serve. He has a one and two career record here, and he's only made one Masters 1000 hardcourt quarterfinal in his career. FAA and Talon Griegsport were also candidates, or are also candidates, I should say, to struggle with the court speed here, but I think they made for uh, more boring choices for upset alert, which is why I went with Bublik. Popcorn is Carlos Alcaraz versus Matteo Arnaldi. Second round potential. It could also be Alcaraz versus Von Asha, but candidly, I hope it's Matteo. If it is... Lots of questionable shot selection, but unquestionable talent, ability, and energy. Arnaldi has become one of my favorite players to watch recently. He's made a concerted effort to, to play more aggressively, uh, to kind of go along with his grittiness. And uh, his forehand is doing a lot of talking as of late. Von Asha, I also enjoy watching, but Alcaraz would need to make quite a few errors in order to lose against Luca. So uh, I, I think Mateo, though, could be interesting. I feel like they've played. I know they played at the U.S. Open. Did they play another time after that? I feel like maybe. Okay. Uh, quarterfinal prediction is Alex Di Minora defeats Carlos Alcaraz. This is not one that I had on the bingo card in, in a couple of ways. Uh, first of all, I just I usually don't pick Di Minora to beat elite players. And... The other way that this comes as a surprise to me is because last year I felt like Alcaraz played the best tennis I've ever seen him play at Indian Wells. So I thought for sure that when, when they go back to Indian Wells and he returns to the conditions that he played such beautiful, beautiful tennis that I'm going to pick him to do amazing things. I just can't quite get there. Um, now, in fairness, in this quarter, I think it's a particularly difficult quarter. Nothing I pick really feels good to me. Uh, but at the end of the day, I don't really trust Alcaraz right now to keep it clean for long periods of time. And uh, the, the ankle thing is not going to help. Um, it's It made it so that 
he couldn't really get a fulfilling uh, golden swing all in all. He had to take some time off. He had to kind of be a little bit low on reps. Uh, the the whole Netflix slam thing didn't didn't make me encouraged about anything with, with Alcaraz. I he he wasn't he was moving cautiously. He was a little bit erratic off the ground. So I'm just not feeling great right now about Carlitos. And uh, Demonor is going to be a pain to hit through. He's going to make his returns. He's going to move the ball around the court. He's going to come forward when he needs to. He can make a gritty hard court work. As he's done in Acapulco, which has been one of his best events. I think he likes the heat and the humidity. Sure, it's not going to be hot and humid at Indian Wells. Certainly not humid. Uh, but I'm going to roll with consistency here. You have to respect what Demonor has been doing. It has been marvelous stuff from him, and he is going to make you play a great match. And right now, Alcaraz, especially with the tough draw and some some uh, potential uh, potential difficult opponents en route to that quarterfinal, I'm not feeling great about Carlitos. You have uh, Hachanov, you have Jari who just beat him, uh, Felix is the potential third round, and as, I, um, as I've as i talked about, I think Arnaldi has a lot of juice, and if Arnaldi plays his best and Alcaraz has a bad performance, I think that is a, a potential upset as well. Let's go to the final weekend. It is Djokovic over Fritz in three, Sinner over Demonor in two, and Sinner over Djokovic in three sets. As you know, I like to limit the technical analysis because these matchups may or may not actually play out, uh, but... Uh, Sinner, 7-0 against Demon Orr, lifetime, beat him in Rotterdam, and I think Yannick can play a lot better than he did in that match. It's uh, uh, much harder for Demon to use his steadiness to his advantage in this matchup compared to the Alcaraz matchup. Djokovic is 9-0 against Fritz, beat him in Australia this year. I think Novak can play a lot better than he did in that match. I'm a broken record here. I do think Taylor improved his tactics drastically in that match, uh, used the forehand drop shot well, but he just runs into trouble against Novak with the dynamic return and defense required early in rallies. That's where Novak usually gets him. In the final, uh, it comes down to some doubts that I have about Djokovic. He hasn't made a quarterfinal here since 2016. He hasn't played here since 2019. These are strange conditions. They take some getting used to. I uh, And also... The old version of Djokovic, in my opinion, was better suited to win at Indian Wells than the current version of Djokovic. The clinical precision on serve plus one won't be effective as it usually is for him. He'll need to play more from neutral, which is fine against most opponents, obviously. But against Sinner, it makes the task a little bit tougher. This is not about psychology. I know that Yannick has had a lot of success against Djokovic recently. It's not about that for me. It's more about form and conditions. I do think that Yannick Sinner is pretty consistent with the players who have won here recently. He has elite weight of shot, and he excels in rallies. And that is pretty much a common theme that we've seen in all of the, the non-Big 3 champions. Uh, Del Potro, Team, Fritz. Nori Alcaraz. Is Nori a bit of an outlier there? Sure. Also, the conditions were an outlier. It was freezing. It was October. It was it was so slow, it wasn't even funny. And uh, we know what Nori can do uh, with, with those kinds of conditions. So, um, Yannick to win Indian Wells. And now, without further ado, uh, we go to the uh, bonus segment in this episode of Monday Match Analysis. A golden swing takeaways with Nico Pereira, along with some discussion about the ever mysterious ATP Players Council. We're joined once again by Nico Pereira, my good friend, tennis channel commentator, analyst, and the commissioner of South American tennis. You go with that title, Nico? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm good. I'm good. I'm no, just a big okay. fan. I'm just a big fan. I'm I like following it. I have a passion for it, and I really enjoy the way people live tennis in Latin America. It's a bit different, but no commissioner, yeah. none of uh, that. All right. Well, you know, I don't know if you have a choice. I've I've appointed you. So, uh, just big picture, kind of the 
the legacy of uh, this year's Golden Swing, I mean, one thing that sticks out is there were a lot of career-changing runs from guys who hadn't had this, you know, hadn't built up this massive resume uh, or, or had tons of success on tour prior to these big runs. You think Luciano Darderi winning Cordoba, uh, yeah. Facundo Diaz Acosta, Buenos Aires, uh, Mariano Navone didn't win the title but made the final of Rio. Yeah. So I, I want to ask you of those three guys, who do you see having the most uh, repeat success and, uh, you know, showing that, showing that these runs were kind of the start of, of something a lot bigger. Not only do I want to ask you that, but I want to ask you if that, is that an obvious question to you or is that tough? Like, are those three guys close or does one of them really stick out to you? I think Diaz Acosta. I think Diaz Acosta, um, Darderi won in Cordoba, that is altitude. So that is a limiting or, or an equalizing effect. The fact that he, that you win in, um, sea level like uh, Diaz Acosta did in uh, in uh, Buenos Aires is, is important. Plus, this is a guy that had been playing really well. He grew up with bias. You know, th this is a guy that ha had been in, in the radar for quite a bit. And I like the way he plays. I like his physique. In in terms of Nar Narbonne, he, he played really well in, in, in Rio. It was uh, it was inspiring to see him come from the qualifying, never playing an ATP, uh, never winning an ATP match, excuse me, and then, you know, winning four of them, going all the way to the finals where he just ran out of gas. So to me, Diaz Acosta is is uh, is the one that, that uh, we can keep an eye on, and I think he'll be around for years to come. He played that awesome five-setter to start the year at the Australian Open. Yep. So uh, of the three, I mean, I was paying attention to that match. I think Taylor was taken aback at at how well his opponent was was playing on that occasion uh and ended up orchestrating the comeback but uh, i would uh i would have thought that diaz acosta would be your answer what do you love about his game i mean for me the lefty forehand that he possesses is uh is probably the best shot if we're talking singular shot of the three names we're discussing would you agree with that yeah, yeah, I would have to agree, but I just think the package, you know, the guy is, is big, he's strong, he has a solid mentality, he, he he goes about his business outside the court in a way that, you know, we know how, and how tough a road he's had to, to, uh, to uh, endure to get to where he is, so I think he's going to He's going to be staying there. But more important than that, I, I just think Cordova is disappearing. You know, they, they sold the, the license for a, for a grass court 250 in, in Europe. Uh, and that's one less tournament in Latin America. And wh when we see the type, of, uh, the type of support that it gives the Latin American players, it's, it's alarming that we're only going to have five. You know, two five hundreds and and three two fifties. Uh, if you count Mexico as as South America, we'll we'll just count it as Latin America. And then you have uh, a couple of those overlapping. Although Los Cabos is going back to the summer next year, so uh, you will you will have Santiago and, and Rio overlapping again. So that makes it only four weeks for Latin America. And then we're all very excited about the Andy Murray tweet. You know, down. South of the border, we're very excited to to see one of the greatest names in our game, you know, paying attention and and vouching for us. And I I think that's something we should work towards. It's not easy with the yeah. calendar as clogged as it is, and with the Saudi huge money coming into play, and uh, money truly being more abundant in in other parts of the world because Latin America struggles. But I hope the powers that be listen, and uh, I'll, I'll make sure to chip in and put in my my voice there and 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 hopefully we can uh, we can at least keep those events rolling and 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 get some help from from ATP and do some WTAs down there as well. Yeah, I was I was absolutely going to ask you about the schedule. I wanted to talk about that. We'll do it now and then we'll circle back to uh Sebastian Baez later on. Right. Right. Um so Andy Murray's tweet, I think the only part of it that was wrong was the fact that he said it was an unpopular opinion. Because I think it's a popular <laughs> opinion that, that Latin America should should have more events uh, because we see the crowd support. 
Uh, yep. the, the atmospheres are, are so good. But as you mentioned, I think 250s in general, we, we're seeing some get swallowed. Masters 1000s yep. are expanding. There aren't any yep. Masters 1000s uh, in that part of the world right now. In five years, in five years, what do you think this looks like in terms of the calendar? Well, I think there's going to be bigger challengers, and I do believe that it's come to the point where we need a, an A tour and a B tour in terms of uh, like a triple A or a corn ferry tour sort of thing because the the, the big guys um, are claiming you know their right to to do that. So I see it moving in that direction and and having a lot. Uh, of of two hundred thousand dollar challengers for the guys to make points, and then the point system, uh, it has been revamped in the last uh, you know five six seasons, but it will you know it will need a, a closer look in order for you know a certain number of guys to move up to the main tour year after year. There there is no other way that I see this uh, continuing because there is only a certain amount of weeks a year. And then you have to take care of your stars. You know, you have to take care of them. And uh, and, and and we are risking their health. We've seen it. You know, they're playing a lot of tennis. And if we want Davis Cup to go back to home and away ties, I, I think we should shorten the, the calendar and have the slams and have the big tournaments and, and, and sprinkle uh, here and there. But I, I do think that the guys outside the, the top 200 – uh, we'll have to battle the way back back into the into the big tour, I think. So it's almost it, you see the big events kind of coming together, and South America, probably because of money not being a part of that picture. But if we can elevate the lower level of tennis, if we can elevate challenger tennis, make it feel a lot bigger. That would be the the best way forward um or maybe the only way forward well definitely and i think in a way the big tour is going to have to somehow subsidize the, the smaller tour because tournaments being smaller are not going to be able to get you know the same quality of or quantity of sponsorship but that is that is the thing that uh, it's been in, in the works there is talks and uh, i think it will it's inevitable because of the way the tour is going and the TV rights money and, and the point system. And I, it, I just think it's a, it's a natural evolution of the sport. Yeah, I, I agree The the premium product seems to be the, the focus and that seems to be the direction everything is going. Uh, is there any chance Rio becomes a hard court event? I know there's been talks about that for a while with the Olympic venue. Have, have you heard anything there? If not, we can. No, just not really. Thing. You know, Rio, Rio was uh, was bought out by a by a huge company, and and I, I think they can do what they want depending on the calendar. But up to this point, I have not heard of any changes. And if you are going to keep Buenos Aires and Santiago around it, uh, it's it's a good reason to 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 have it. But if you look at the draws this year. Uh, Rio only had Alcaraz, uh, Babrinka, and then the, the, you know after after Alcaraz, Babrinka, you know the, the the next seed was number twenty in the world, so they cannot be paying guarantees. And and Alcaraz went because he was in the last year of a three year deal. I don't think they're going to be able to afford him from here on end. So those are you know small nuances that are big numbers are a lot of zeros and for tournaments in Latin America, they're just very hard to absorb if you, they want to keep any profit. Yeah. It's uh, it's going to be fascinating to see what, uh, what plays out in the next couple of years with this. Again, I think, I think we both agree. There's almost a, a divide here in terms of everybody wanting more and the reality that it's probably going to be less. Uh, let's talk about, Baez, I've uh, I've appointed you commissioner of South American tennis. I've appointed him king of the Golden Swing, uh, which is a title which is a title that has shifted hands. I think it went Garin, and then it went Rude, and and now I'm handing it over to Baez. Is that fair? And, and yesterday and last year, excuse me, 
was Nori and Alcaraz reaching the Buenos Aires and the Rio final. But yes, he, he's been very regular. Um, and I'm glad that finally, you know, he, he got to win his first 500. I, you know, this is a guy that everybody admires because we know how hard his road has been to the top. And he just, you know, he's a very hard worker, loved the way he goes about his business, struggled a bit about a year and a half ago, brought in Javier Frana and started having good results last year right away. And uh, this is a kid that uh, he's, he's earned every inch uh, on his way up. And uh, I think he will keep on climbing. Super fun to watch with the amount of power he delivers uh, despite his height. And he's so quick around the court. He's a dominant baseliner at his best. Uh, but you kind of alluded to the streakiness. It's remarkable how many titles he's won. Five titles in three years on tour. That's It's on par with only the best. Yep. Uh, at, at the same time, he's gone on these massive losing streaks. Uh, you know, it, he'll go two months without... Uh, winning a match, taking a bunch of first-round losses. And, and we've seen that be the ebb and flow early on in his career. Can you explain why why he's been so streaky? Is there I an explanation? Think, I think it's his psyche. You know, who who knows what's going on? You know, how much he's struggled. Uh, his uh, self-esteem. How, uh, how hard does he take losses and how... Does that reflect on next week's work? Um, so, you know, players do tend to get in streaks. Sometimes you go uh, in a streak that uh, you lose four or five, uh, you know, tie breaks in the third set and you just, you know, get out of that slump. And so far, he's taken the right measures to get out of those slumps because it's not uh, if, it's a matter of when you, you, you get into those funks. And he's been able to climb out of them. So if every time you fall down, you get you get up and you try something new and you try something different, that's what it's going to take. And then you know, reinventing and revamping his game constantly. And this is a guy that will give it his all, so he will get out of those slumps. But as to explain them, sometimes, you know, just bad draws in terms of matchups for his style of game, maybe choosing the wrong tournaments. You know, he's played, he's won tournaments in, in hardcore as well. So this, this is a guy that just last summer uh, won the tournament before the U.S. Open. So so that's good for him. Those are those are good signs that this is an old court sort of, uh, of player and he will keep developing his game and he's only 23. So I have faith that uh, that he's going to have one of those great, remarkable careers. Yeah, the, the Winston-Salem title, yeah, was was great. It's also another example of how uh, how almost out of nowhere he can be and how how hot and cold because he was on a massive hard court losing streak. Career hard court record wasn't good, and then bang, he goes zero to one hundred and and wins a title on hard court. Uh, so I I'm kind of in the same place that you are in terms of the psyche. I imagine uh, it, like when he was struggling on hard court, I thought there's no way that he doesn't have the skill set and the tennis abilities to, I mean, maybe it won't be as good as clay, but it's got to be better than, than it was um, on hard court. And uh, like, for me, it just has to be uh, a certain fragility in the confidence level on, on the hard court that had to work itself out. And uh, it's kind of in line with, with what we're saying. So I, my, I feel like he's at a career high ranking 18 in the world. What I want to see from him the rest of the year is uh, is just a little bit more stability when things aren't going well, and maybe you know second round, third round losses instead of first round losses piling up. Well, that I think that's on the path that he's in. He's had pretty uh, consistent uh, results on all surfaces, and I believe that the hardcore bit was. I think he's taken care of that. You know, if you see him this year, he's bulked up. A bit and and in hardcore sometimes you need to hit through people. It's just not enough uh, with uh, retrieving and and defending. So I, I think he he's working on that element and that forehand is popping a little bit more. He's using that down the line backhand uh, a little bit sooner, and I think that's going to you know be a good one for him on that surface. You have a, a role on the players' council, right? Yes, I am the alumni representative in the player council that uh, 
That is a role that did not exist before. We had the alumni, but we did not sit at the table and we did not have a vote. We do uh, both things now and we work very, very hard uh, to achieve that. And uh, it's been a year and I just got reelected for another two years and the guys have been fantastic. They, they you know, they didn't know me because I'm, I'm ancient in, in tennis years, and uh, but they've taken well to to uh, my advice, but I definitely take a back seat because it, it is the player council after all. And uh, I'm, I prob- I'm probably the elder, but uh, it's their tour. They are the players. So I just sit back, listen, and if I'm asked, I, I speak. And then, you know, I, I might, uh, you know, whisper uh, here and there, but uh, it is an honor and, and it's really something that uh, that fulfills me and and gives me an opportunity to give back to the game that has given me so much. Yeah, that, that's awesome, Nico. And congratulations on on your reelection. Uh, so, in, in other words, you are supposed to be a, or, or you are uh, a voice for the alumni of the tour, meaning the the retired players. So, uh, there are things such as um, um, pensions and uh, certain perks, uh, right? Like the tours want to take care of of their for, of their former members. And uh, you can kind of represent that sect. Am I? I'm saying that accurately. Yes, basically all all the alumni. It's about six hundred of us uh, get invited to vote for a representative, and then I try to deal with the pension, which has you know been a, an issue for years because uh, when the tour started in in uh, in eighty nine, uh, we the players that contributed to the tour since eighty nine gave a part of, a, of our money, of the money that the tournament set aside for the pension to the players that came before us. And then there were certain mistakes made at the time that we lost funds because of bad investments. We were like sort of the guinea pigs. And then, you know, we didn't receive any sort of help from the players that came after. So I didn't think that was fair. We've been talking to 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 the management and to the tournament and to the our uh, our uh, committee, financial committee, to try and you know help the guys out. Uh, without going into too much detail, I, we deal with that. We deal into alumni recognition on the tournaments. We encourage the tournaments to recognize past champions and local heroes and whatnot. We do events next weekend in Indian Wells. We'll have a golf outing that we've been having for uh, uh, some years now, maybe five or six years since I've been in the committee. Uh, we try to do dinners in, in different tournaments. We try to uh, encourage the guys to go to tournaments and try to facilitate access uh, in all ATP tournaments for, for uh, alumni. So, yeah, we try to do as much as possible, and I'm, I'm hoping – I'll be replaced in the in the next two years, trying to groom some younger blood to come in with uh, with a little more push, but definitely uh, put the ex players in the radar and and uh, make the guys feel good about the family that we are. Because after all, our dream when we were kids was was to play on tour. When I started playing, it was not about the money; it was about the lifestyle and about the titles. And uh, the money came after, and it, it doesn't hurt to to the few guys that made it. But they have to remember that there are a lot of guys that that didn't make wealth and um, that sometimes are struggling with trying to create a fund for um, a bigger fund for more emergencies, uh, financial or medical. So, yeah, trying to look after our own. Yeah, it's a it's a great thing. Uh, the Players Council as a whole is something that has sort of a, a mystique attached to it. Uh, everybody is aware that it exists. Uh, fans are certainly aware that it exists. Uh, but sometimes, uh, because this stuff isn't very, you know, public uh, at, at all, there are, I think, questions about how this all actually works. So, if somebody asks you, Nico, what what is the Players Council? What does it do? How would you answer that? Well, it's a it's a group of ten individuals, one alumni, one from the coaches' side. They have a, a few double representatives, a few uh, 1 to 25, 25 to 50 in various uh, levels, in all levels. And it has to be diverse in terms of geography. We need uh, not, you know, we, we have limitations on Europeans or Americans that, that can be there. We try to make it 
as as um, balanced as possible. So there is the the player advisory council, which is you know what it's called now. Then there is the player board representative. That is four of them. Our colleague Mark Knowles is there, and Pablo Andujar is there, along with two other uh, very uh, exceptional individuals in in Elo, Enopolo and and Luben Pampulov. And those four tournament uh, player representatives deal with the four. Uh, tournament uh, board representatives and the deciding vote it's the CEO of ATP um, or you know that it's uh, Andrea Gaudenzi so so the tournament has their their council their board as to the players the council the board and then there is a deciding vote and pretty much that's the structure of the governance of tennis nowadays how often do you meet uh <laughs> We meet, uh, I would say, uh, formally about five times a year. Uh, there was a meeting in Australia. There was supposed to be a meeting this week in Indian Wells. It got postponed to Miami. In the French Open, there is a meeting. Uh, Wimbledon, there is a meeting. U.S. Open, there is a meeting. There is another meeting later. But it, we have a group chat and we constantly talk to each other so it's a it's a constant communication situation okay and uh the the process that you described in terms of decision making uh just making sure that i have this right so it's uh andrea gaudenzi as the chairman it's his job to take into account what he what what the advice of the players council is is that right or or is there a formal vote on on decisions where the players council gets to to put in a vote uh which which one is it well it's all of them because we sometimes meet uh with andrea most of the time is with andrea present so he was a player so he he listens and then uh uh maximo who's is, who is the president uh he he also is the right hand of of andrea and he he makes day-to-day -day decisions uh, but the players uh, should communicate or talk more with the board. The board is the one that takes the, the issues directly to the, to the management, if you will. And uh, then management makes the final decision. But it's between the boards, both the tournament and the players. And we're an advisory council. We're a sounding board to, to the, the issues. For example, the ball that uh, we're dealing with. Yeah. You know, the proposal is to... Uh, at least try to make it equal in terms of the swings. If they don't play the South American swing each week with a different ball, try to make it as even as possible or say the swings going into a major, try to play it with the same ball as the major does. So, so try to have some, some uh, balance there and, and, and unify all the, uh, the aspects of the game. So the guys can, can feel as comfortable as possible. That's why it's represented by by various various um, uh, uh, various groups of the game in terms of singles players, top singles players, at large singles players, and the doubles players that are very very involved uh, always and and try to try to find solutions to 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 those issues. Yeah, yeah. Well, good to good to hear. The ball thing is is on the agenda. Not surprising because. Uh, certainly, there's been some noise about that uh, in, in recent times. This was breaking news like just before we got on. I'm not going to put you on the spot. I haven't read enough yet to really talk about it. But uh, Simona Halep's suspension has been reduced, and she's been clear to return to the uh, to the tour. Uh, my, my question will not be so specifically about that, but um, have there been conversations within the Players' Council uh, about um, the – the procedure as it pertains to the ITIA and doping, because the pattern that that has certainly emerged is uh, these suspensions tend to be reduced. Like the ITIA will hand down an initial suspension, the player will appeal. These appeals have been uh, largely uh, successful. And I, I don't know if that factors in, but I know for a fact, certainly in the sports where there's a uh, really a collective bargaining process between the players and the leagues usually drug testing is a part of those conversations yeah the the um that 
agency works independently for obvious reasons. So they have their way of working and they have their mandate. And then lawyers get involved. And you know what happens when expensive lawyers get involved. So uh, there has not been a conversation. I am sure that it will come uh, at some point. And I agree with you. It, it, it just doesn't make sense that they, they hand out these very long suspensions only then uh, for them to be shortened. So, and again, I believe it is because there is not an agreement, although there is an agreement between management and players and tournaments, the agency that regulates the things like the drugs or the betting are completely outsourced because they need to be. Right. Nico, this has been awesome. Thanks so much for coming on. Hey, it's always a pleasure. I look forward to seeing you. Congrats on the show. And my best to all of your listeners. You are Thank doing you. the right thing. Take care, Gilly. My man.